the Epiphone Greenie has arrived. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Well, my friends, this might be the last time that we ever talk about Greenie on the show, until maybe when Kirk Hammett sells it, but that's gonna be a long time. It's the Epiphone Greenie. Let's dive into this. So if you're not familiar, Greenie is a very famous 1959 burst. Kirk Hammett had recently purchased it, caused a storm on the internet, but he's been loving it. He's been enjoying it. He's been playing it. It's been living on its legacy. He didn't rip out the pickups and put EMGs in it like some people were thinking, but it's Peter Green and Gary Moore as the two famous owners even before then, and Gibson has been going crazy with this thing. So we reviewed the $50,000 custom shop version, and then the followed up $20,000 custom shop version that didn't have the Brazilian rosewood fretboard. And then Gibson USA came out with their version of a satin finished greenie, and then later released the greenie bucker pickups for sale separately for $300. And now we've got the Epiphone Greeny version. These are $14.99, which is expensive for an Epiphone, and I was kind of scared about these things because they gave us the pickups aftermarket that we could put in any Epiphone that we wanted. So I was scared about the future of these. But then they decided to do this. And by this, I mean they gave an Epiphone the Gibson Open Book headstock style. This has not happened in many a years. I believe the first time that ever occurred was in the late 80s. You could also find some 90s versions. The Epiphone elitists had, you know, kind of a different headstock. But to have this headstock on an Epiphone again is history making and just made me so much more interested in this guitar. The peripheral of playing it, it almost seems kind of like a Japanese made Gibson or something. But the biggest fail in my opinion is if you're gonna do the Gibson headstock style, why do we still have the three screw truss rod covered? Like, I get it, we'll see it on the workbench that that's just how those are routed in the neck, but they should have changed that up to have the two screw style because that's the only thing that's ruined the vibe of this headstock at this point, in my opinion. I like that this one doesn't have the satin finish. It's what Epiphone calls their aged gloss, kind of a slightly buffed down finish without it feeling cheap. So I think that matches the vibe pretty good. And we've got a nice little flame top here that does dance. And of course we got the Gibson USA greenie buckers in here. We've got our mix match knobs. And besides just the guitar, you get your inspired by Gibson custom shop Lifton style reissue case. It's obnoxiously pink in the center and brown on the exterior with the branding. And it's got three latches on the front, one on the back. However, as far as the case candy department goes, you don't really get much of anything outside Epiphone stickers. However, in terms of branding of the guitar, do we have Kirk Hammett on the backside of the headstock like we saw on his new Flying V? No, there's actually no branding on this thing anywhere that's visible. So I suppose that could be a good and or a bad thing, depending on how you feel about Kirk and any of the other history behind the greeny guitar. So if you just want a really specked out Epiphone Les Paul that just happens to have the Gibson headstock style, this could be what you're looking for. But if this model is not necessarily for you, we have been told that this is not going to be a one-off. We have been teased that they're going to be doing this on other high-end Epiphones in the future. It seems they're trying to rebrand Epiphone from what most people think of them as like a budget $100 Les Paul into more mid-ranged instruments, that $1,500-ish dollar price point, but yet still offer some slightly more affordable versions. So for comparison's sake here, I would say the closest thing within Epiphone's lineup that you could say this is similar to would be the 1959 Les Paul Epiphone reissue. Those things are $999. They come with very similar appointments. They have Gibson Burst Bucker 2 and 3. They have the same case that this has. So why is the Greeny $500 more expensive? Because let's face it, you could buy the 59 Epi. That's going to cost you $999 buy the greeny buckers for 300. So at that point you're $200 away and your finish is a little bit different and it comes down to having that Gibson headstock style. And if you want to be realistic, when you pull out those burst buckers, you could probably get about $200 for a set of those. And let's say you don't know how to install pickups and you have to pay somebody 50 bucks for that. You definitely can get a similar guitar for a lot cheaper. It just comes down to how much do you appreciate the greeny burst finish and how badly do you want the Gibson headstock on an Epiphone? There's also a few other differences that we'll talk about over on the workbench, but we need to save some good stuff for then. But first impressions. This feels like a really quality instrument. It's not like some of the older Epiphones. I would argue the fret wire straight out of the box feels a little bit better than standard Epiphones. This thing is actually quite chunky. It's got quite a sizable neck on it, but let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs before we fully judge it and get to that playing demo. Mm -hmm. 
inside the current most expensive Chinese Epiphone. Let's take a look at our pickups. Are they telling the truth? Do we have the greenie buckers in here? I can confirm, yes we do. Dated to March of 2023. And the bridge is labeled Lead Greenie 322 of 23. I do want to make a small mention of the pickup rings. It would have been nice to have seen them upgrade that to Gibson USA as well, because these are really thick in this area. They're not quite as visually appealing, but that's something you're only going to notice if you're like really into the nitty gritty details. Sadly, to swap those out to the Gibson style, you would have to fill a couple of the holes and like reposition them. Also worth mentioning, this has the two conductor braided wiring style. However, the Epiphones decide to cover it over in this black material. Now our pickup readings within the circuit, middle position for fun, 4.23k ohms, bridge at 8.68, and the neck, 8.24. Here's a look at our neck pickup cavity. You can see it has a long neck tenon construction and is labeled 8, and then we've got like a 5 over there. Here you can see our mahogany body with our maple top. So it's our regular mahogany body, and then they do put a top on it, and it is maple, but it's not the figured that you're seeing here. This is a real wood veneer placed over top of that. So unfortunately, I cannot tell you how many pieces of a top this is, but it does have a two-piece center seam veneer. Here's a look inside our bridge pickup cavity and our QR code with a whole bunch of stuff going on. This is the only place that has Kirk Hammett and or the Greeny name anywhere on this thing. I like how it says Kirk Hammett G. Reeney 1959 LPS TD. The bridge is pretty interesting on this. It's not a true ABR1 in style because we still have the stud within the body. However, it does still function with regular thumb wheels, kind of like a traditional ABR1. But then the tops of your screws have a slit in it so you can help adjust those up and down. So if it's like poking you because your thumb wheels have to be so low, you can sink that further into the body. They basically just use that stud to help secure it so they don't have to do the whole double thumb wheel thing. It's cool. But the bridge itself looks like this. They're going for the wire retainer style. However, the back is just your standard B2 branded one. So this is not necessarily anything too special. And then it's your typical Epiphone Loctone style tailpiece, branded as such. The poker chip doesn't have the usual rhythm treble because it's trying to replicate the original being aged and having that worn off. Other than that, they're not really trying to age these guitars or anything. Just that kind of buffed down gloss finish is all they did to this particular version. But if you wanted to put your little pinky wear area there, just grab some sandpaper. Nothing's new with our electronics, just a different knob set for each volume and tone combination. But moving on from our mahogany body and maple top, we've got the mahogany neck with the Indian Laurel fretboard. Fender has started to bring back rosewood on their imports. I would like to see rosewood back on these. Maybe it's because these are made in China versus the Mexican Fenders. For a laurel board, this doesn't look bad. It's not overly dried out. It's got a very good color to it. But here's the thing I was alluding to that makes this kind of a weird spec. Why do we have real Mother of Pearl inlays on this? I love it, but not even the original Greenie has true Mother of Pearl because that's just not how those were done in the 50s. So it's a premium spec that they didn't have to do, but they just decided to do it. A lot of Epiphones are starting to get Pearl. So I wonder if there was a change in laws, because I always thought it had to do something with them importing them to the USA and other countries to sell it. The Mother of Pearl just made it much more tricky. So for that reason, if you think these inlays look a little bit brighter and whiter than the celluloid stuff, that's because that is the case. Personally, I'm happy about it. It gives you a little bit more value for your money. Although I much rather would have just seen a rosewood board. <laughs> 24 3 quarter inch scale and 12 inch fretboard radius. I measure 1.68 inches at the nut. That increases to 2.05 at the 12th. First fret neck depth 0.92 and one at the 10th since we were kind of hitting the heel. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. Nice rounded C. And now our headstock. So this isn't exactly the same Gibson headstock style. The edges are just a little bit more rounded and not quite as pointed. And I think they did that on purpose, just so, you know, some unscrupulous people who might want to swap headstock veneers won't do that. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the back side. But here's what it looks like with your truss rod cover off. It's just your standard Epiphone style truss rod. That would have been cool had they given us the typical 
hex key adjustment one that Gibsons have. So I was telling you earlier, the three screw truss rod was my least favorite spec about this thing. And the reason why you can't put a two on there is because it routes it all the way through there. And that's where the screw needs to go. However, I'm very pleased to tell you, if you wanted to put one on here, it would look like this. You would just have to make one new screw hole right there. And then thankfully, the wings of the traditional one do indeed cover the screw holes just barely. But you would still vaguely be able to see the truss rod cavity. But from far away, you would never notice. The only other thing I want to mention is the Epiphone logo looks so flat. The Gibsons have so much more shine to it. There's like almost a 3D like element, but it still does have a little bit of a pearlescent shine to it. And you know, maybe some of that's just the worn gloss finish rather than the full gloss that we are just looking at. Moving on to the back, this appears to be a two piece mahogany body. I wasn't sure if they were going to like put a veneer over it to make it look like a one piecer, but I think you could just kind of tell from the wood grain, like this particular piece of wood has a lot of a movement to it as far as the figuring goes, whereas this piece doesn't have as much. It's just a little bit different, but you can really see that seam line right there. So I feel like that could have been another spot where we could have saw a premium spec of a one piece body, but we do indeed have the CTS pots. They are 500k in style and you can see our capacitors right there. They're the yellow ones. Kind of surprised to not see the orange drop caps. And again, I feel like they need better solder work, but it functions, it's fine. It's just something I've been noticing on these higher end epis. We've got a cream jack plate strap button here and another one there. And here's a quick peek into our toggle switch cavity. You can see that one was just a little bit too close to the edge. I was trying to see if this had the historic thin binding in the cutaway and it's got the thin binding, but I'm not seeing the top. At certain angles, I think I can see it, but maybe this finish is just so dark it hides it. But what is strange is you can see an area where it wasn't like fully stained that runs along the entire body, just like right before the body begins. I don't know if that's like uneven scraping of the finish or over scraping, or if that's just how the binding is. You're not really going to notice it from a couple of feet away. I mean, we're kind of nitpicking it at this point. I do like the wood grain of the body. Very beautiful on the edges. And I just like the back color in general. They did a great job on that. So this is a one piece neck. We don't have any scarf joints or anything like that. So that's another premium spec that these ones will have. But here's where it differs from a Gibson. This does not appear to have headstock wings. So the way Gibson creates their headstock to reduce waste, they'll glue two wings of wood to create the open book headstock shape. That way they don't have to take a chunk of wood that's this big and then route it down. I know there's certain angles where it looks like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe there is, but no, usually it's just the rounded over edge. I've looked at the end grain and I do not see any headstock wings. It is possible that I'm wrong, but it's certainly not as obvious on a Gibson if it is the case. We've got the Grover tuners with the Schaller spade style tips and our serial number of this one dating it to 2023 first two digits and IGC standing for inspired by Gibson custom. But all said and done, eight pounds, 11.2 ounces. I don't understand how it feels like 10 and a half pounds, but OK, it's supposed to be a good weight. Let's go ahead, and plug it in and hear how this one sounds. <laughs>
now that we know all about the Epiphone Greenie, what are my final thoughts? This is a tough guitar to review because it's Epiphone's first like most expensive take on their Chinese made models. It's the first one in a long time to feature the Gibson headstock. Ugh, I'm just having a hard time getting around that $1,500 price point. For me, 1200 and under is like the perfect spot for Epiphone. So now that we're even starting to cross a new line that we were just starting to get used to, it will take some time for the market to adjust to that. I honestly think you'd be better off buying one of the Epiphone Lazaruses on the used market because it had very similar specs to it. Now, of course, you don't get the headstock, so it's not exactly apples to apples. But for me, rather than the bringing the Gibson headstock onto the Epiphone, I would rather see them change the nut style that they use. Instead of this cheapy import looking one, let's get a nice finely crafted one. That's not sticking up a whole bunch over the edge and let's fine tune the sides. Let's stop using the poly finish and bring like a true nitro onto Epiphone or something that feels a little bit closer because that's the thing. This still feels like an Epiphone, yet it looks like a Gibson. Like this is getting very close to a Les Paul 50s or 60s standard. The neck is very similar to that of a 50s. And while you're playing it, if you're used to the Gibson headstock style, you are seeing that, but yet it still feels like an Epiphone. I think they're close, but I would rather see them put the money into fine tuning all these other little elements the mother of pearl inlays they're nice they're great but i think that could probably be put better elsewhere maybe even give us the gibson usa style knobs because these just aren't it now all that said is this a bad guitar no it's not it's phenomenal if you love greeny and you can't afford the gibson usa version and you want something that is officially greeny not something you have to create yourself i think it's worth it but if nothing else, I hope this video helps you make an informed decision on whether one of these is right for you or not. If you're interested in being the next owner of my demo piece here, you can find it for sale on my website, troglisguitarshow.com. And if not, we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one. Thank you.